My name is Richard L. Rand, R-I-C-H-A-R-D, L, middle initial, Brandt, B-R-A-N-D-T. Mm. What is your birthday? 8-1-29. And where were you born? Lincoln, Nebraska. Mm. And tell me about your family when you were growing up. I had one brother, mm. older. Uh, my father was a mechanic. My mother was a housewife and started school in a small town in Nebraska. Then ended up graduated from Lincoln High School mm. in Lincoln, Nebraska. When did you graduate? 1948. And then what did you do? I went to work right away for the Burlington Railroad. Railroad? Railroad. What kind of work was Well, I worked in the coach yards and then finally ended up as a brakeman in the, after I got back from Korea and then turned up diabetic in 1960 and could no longer continue with the traveling on the railroad. So I quit in 62 and moved to Hot Springs in 64. 62, I'm sorry. Got married in 64 in Hot Springs. I see. Um, did you know anything about Korea around the time that you graduated high school? No, no. Just on the map, you know, in history and that. But no, had no idea of Korean politics or anything, no. Or the history or the culture? No. No, nothing? No. And when did you join the military? I did. I was drafted. When? In January of 1951. Mm -hmm. um, if I was drafted, I was guaranteed a job back with the railroad. If I enlisted, I, I had quit the railroad. No guarantee. So I they decided I better have a job when I get out. So I took the draft. I see. And where did you get the basic military training? Basic training was Fort Riley, Kansas. How was it? In January, cold. <laughs> it was good. It was infantry training. And did you have any idea that you would end up in Korea at the time? Well, it was the only conflict going on, so I had a very good idea. Yeah. That's where I was going. Were you afraid? No. Were you impatient or anxious? Uh, I was more so inclined to get a training first, so I knew what the heck I was doing. Otherwise, you were a lost soul, mm. you know, without any training. So when did you leave for Korea? In, uh, let's see, my... I got out of basic training in May. My mother passed away two weeks later, oh. and I went to the funeral and left approximately one and a half hours after the funeral. I left Lincoln and went to Seattle, Washington, and from Seattle, Washington, got on a ship and went to, we couldn't go all the way across on the ship, it was too small, so we had to stop in ADAC. Alaska to take on supplies, and then landed at Yokohama, and then was at Camp Drake in Tokyo, and they called off all the service numbers, and there was about 10 of us left, and they fell us in together and said, you fellows are going to go to Signal Corps school in the island of Edojima. And Edojima was off the coast of Kuri in Japan. And it was the Japanese Annapolis for Japan. And a very, very large complex, but a very small island. And just across the bay from Kuri, Japan. We went by train, went through Hiroshima. It was just like the day of the bomb was. It hadn't been nothing done, and I said, how come those people don't do something? And finally, the sergeant told me, he said, when you lose about three-fourths of your men between 18 and 50, who's going to do the work? And I said, 
very shy. <laughs> True. There was all kind. All you saw were women. There was, well, they killed probably 80% of their men mm -hmm. in World War II yeah. between the ages of 18 and 50. Mm -hmm. And those that were still alive were probably one arm or a leg missing. They couldn't do much. But that was six years after the, mm. the bomb would, had been dropped. But it was still just rubble. So tell me about the signal course school. What kind of education did you get? High school? What? I had. I took no, 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 signal corps in Japan. Oh, it's in Japan. What kind of skill oh, did you learn? They had a pole yard where we climbed poles and did wiring. And then... Uh, um, Were you good at climbing the pole? Climbing the poles, yes. Were you good? Oh, I, did, well, I never was good at heights. <laughs> but I shook a few poles loose. But, <laughs> but I did. And then... Uh, I was, it was a month school, and then we had to stay the first week before we got any leaves. Then we could go into the village after the first week, but we had to climb the top of the pole. Other than climbing the pole, what did you learn? What did you learn? Did you learn about the Morse code, or what did you well, learn? wiring, which I took wiring electrical in high school, and I was that was probably why I was... a selected for that mm -hmm. but other than that yeah you learned how to lay wire and then basket weave the the wire so it would hold and tie square knots everything had to be a square knot not that difficult no no but uh, it was just a month of training so when did you leave for korea from there from they took us across the little bay to curry we caught a train to sasebo from Sasebo, they put us on a tugboat and went across the bay to Pusan, Korea. When did you That know? was probably August, late August of 51. And I went from Pusan to Chuncheon, Korea by train. And it was well ventilated. More 50 caliber holes in it and you could shake a stick at it. No windows. <laughs> it had been shot up something terrible. Mm. And, uh, but uh, then that was 7th Division headquarters, was Chuncheon, Korea. 7th Division? Right. And I was assigned to the 32nd Regiment of the 7th Division, and that was our signal. And we were approximately oh, four to five miles behind the front lines. Um, there was an area, they called it the helmet area. From that point forward, you had to wear a helmet. Be behind that, you could wear a soft cap or something. But from that point forward, and then that was a civilian line also. No civilian Koreans above that, which they called a combat line or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, then from that point forward, if you were assigned, you got four points a month. And it took 36 months to ro 36 points to rotate. What was like a Korea to you at the time? That when you saw Busan and Chuncheon, all this area, how was it to you? Uh, the only big town I was at was Chuncheon and Seoul. And Seoul was pretty well beat up. Uh, of course, it was right close to the. And Chinchon wasn't too bad. Um, where we were at was right on the 38th par parallel. And uh, um, there was, there's still a lot of combat going on, but it was, at about the time I left was when they started really tailing off with the peace talks and, and but uh, no, there was still, there was a lot of, uh, if you saw somebody riding in a helicopter, you knew they were bad. They were, they they were hurt bad. Mm -hmm. If they had them on the back of a jeep on a stretcher, it was more or less maybe a flesh wound or something, not as bad. But if they were in a helicopter, they were not good. Mm -hmm. 
What was the most difficult thing during your service there? Uh, getting used to the, the water, watered eggs, watered potatoes, <laughs> not real, you know, instant potatoes, instant eggs. <laughs> we had a Korean boy that did the mixing. In the milk, every once in a while, you get a bubble of dry powder, <laughs> but it wasn't that bad. There's a lot of things worse. Tell me about the life there. Where did you sleep? And tell me about the typical day of your uh, duties. Uh, well, we lived in tents, squad tents. There was approximately eight or nine to a tent, two heaters, and two days in a row, it got 33 below zero. And I mean, it, did you have a stove? Uh, we had we had oil burning stoves, yes. But the oil would coagulate when that, so we'd have to cut it with gasoline to make it thin enough to run. And we had now. Uh, first, we had the Ethiopian troops, United troops, mm. with us from Ethiopia, and they couldn't handle that 30 below. I mean, their natural temperature is probably 95 to 100 <laughs> right. year round. And then we had the Cubans, and that was, they could run faster backwards than they could forward. <laughs> they what, do you, were, what do you mean Cuban? They are American, right? American? No, from Cuba. From Cuba? That was before we split with Cuba. We split in what, 90, in 57 mm -hmm. or so? So but as a part of American force, they were, right? Yes, yeah. but they were all Cuban, from Cuba. And the Ethiopians were all Ethiopians with their own commanders. It was United Forces. Then we had the Dutch. Mm -hmm. And they, they were the toughest people you ever want to met. They'd start a fight in a room by themselves. They, they, loved, they loved to fight. And they were tougher than, tougher than sin. <laughs> but um, they... They, they loved to fight. <laughs> they didn't care whether it was their half-brother. <laughs> they, they, they just fight. Fighting but, against each other? Well, we just boxing, you know, fighting. But they were very tough on the field. They, yeah, tell me about it. Well, they, I don't think they ever took prisoners. They'd interrogate them, and then say, go turn him loose. Well, as soon as they were out of sight, he was gone. He was history. I don't think they ever, they were just mean. Nah. Then salty. Very, very tough people. The Ethiopians were all, oh, at least six foot tall and probably maybe 110 pounds. They'd have to stand twice to make a shadow. <laughs> and very thin, but angular, tall, and the Cubans, they, they could run faster backwards than they could forwards. <laughs> they weren't much for any conflict or anything. How about Dutch? The Dutch? Unreal. What do you mean? Mean. I mean, they, they were, they, when they said fight, I mean, they didn't hesitate. <laughs> they had a fuse about... <laughs> So that means that they were brave. They were brave, yes. Do they you, were very gutty. Do you have any other episode? Nothing with them. They were attached to us. They were the 32nd Regiment, mm -hmm. in which we all were in the same area. But I... Uh, so the typical day, what did you do? Well, for a while I drove the commanding officer around. Uh, a young lieutenant. He was a very nice guy. My my sergeant was a colored sergeant. The best guy I ever met in my life. Very nice. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was from Detroit. Really a good egg. And that was when they start, first started integrating uh, the color into military because uh, there was at Fort Riley, in basic training, there was two colored 
one was from LA, he was just a regular shoe, and the other boy was from down south, and he was, well, being from Nebraska, well, I never knew any, and if they were, color meant nothing to me. If they were a good egg, they were a good egg. If they were a dud, they were a dud. <laughs> but I could take care less about color. That's only skin deep. Anyway, the guy from down south was very standoffish because he was always what you'd say the back of the bus. And the other guy from L.A. was, his name was Bradshaw, my name Brant, you know where we slept. <laughs> he on the bottom and me on the top bunk. <laughs> was it Bon Quebec? Oh, he was a good egg. Mm. He was a bear. He was really nice. Um, but uh, completely different from the other fellow be, due to the location where he was raised. Were you able to go out of the headquarters and mingle with the Koreans and other? Uh, the Koreans weren't allowed up there. Oh. From that line, like the helmet line, there was no civilians allowed. So we were in an area where we were all military. No, if we got back behind it, then we could mingle with the Korean people. Yes, true, but never got that, never got back that much at all. When, I think in February of 52, um, no, there was 50, 44 Ethiopians and six Americans on the plane. Uh -huh. We flew from Chuncheon, Korea, we sat in bucket seats on the side, and the, the middle of the plane was all tarped down, was mail bags. Mail guys wrote home, mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, uh, Ethiopians, some of them had never flown, and when they're here, <laughs> oh, it was a, <laughs> we landed at Tachikawa in Tokyo. And then went wherever we wanted to go for five days. R and R. Uh, R and R, mm -hmm. right? And uh, then back to Tokyo, and uh, we stayed another three days due to the fact a couple of guys had went AWOL, and they made sure they went back or <laughs> and took our place. So we waited for the next flight and went back to Korea, and it was oh, colder than sin. <laughs> in Korea, but as North, we were right at the 38th parallel, which is about like Canada in this North America, and it was cold, mm -hmm. but no, very little humidity. You could hear a Jeep coming five miles away, the snow was so crisp and, and brittle, but we did see a lot of pheasants, a Chinese ring neck, and then uh, a lot of deer, at, which were probably spooked to death from all the action, but there was game in that. And then they did allow uh, officers to check out a shotgun and go pheasant hunting. And we uh, had a Sunday, our church was on the hood of a Jeep. The preacher would come out and meet us in the field and throw the cloth over the, and put the Bible up, and have, have church. Well, we went out one Sunday, and he never showed up. Pretty soon, here come a Jeep, 90 miles an hour, through the dirt, and he come over and he said, you guys might as well go back to your unit. There won't be no church today. And some kid said, well, how's come? Well, he said, the preacher checked out with some other guys a shotgun to go pheasant hunting, he stepped on a landmine, Aye. and he's on his way, <laughs> he's gone. And he said, we'll, we'll get a replacement preacher in a couple of weeks or so, and we'll have church again, but you'll be notified. And, but he uh, was, I don't know where this happened or a thing, but he was killed hunting. Probably got into a minefield and didn't realize it, but you only have the one chance. Hmm. What was your rank? PFC. PFC. Right. They froze the rank in, I think, in June. Or, well, our names come up for corporal on their ranking list. They took it and tore it down. 
and torn down. And I thought, what, what did we do? We screwed up or something? Didn't make it? Well, they brought the 45th National Guard unit from Oklahoma in. They had 500 sergeants and two PFCs. <laughs> Hmm. And they all had rank. There was more rank than you. We ended up with two first sergeants, one of them, because the National Guard Division from Oklahoma had more sergeants than they had anything else. And they froze the rank. It was locked from there on. I don't know when they ever did open it up. I was gone what, if they did. But we ne none of us ever got any more rank. That was the end of it. What did you do when you were not in duties? Remember? Oh, a lot of us, well, we'd read. And we had a radio, uh, an all-band radio. And then we had a guy... Radio? What, what broadcasting? What program? Well, it was, it was uh, United Forces or some radio. I don't know what. To be truthful, we but at American program. I think so. Yes. And then we had a guy they called Jackpot Charlie, <laughs> and he come over in an old airplane. You could just hear him coming. Bad Chuck Charlie. Bad. Bad. No. Jackpot. Jackpot Charlie. Jackpot Charlie. He was luckier than heck to be alive. Tell <laughs> he, me. He flew over our area in this old plane. You could hear it coming. North Koreans. North Korean. Yeah. But from. 20 miles away you could hear it coming. And he dropped these little square leaflets. Don't you want to be home for Christmas, G.I.? Tell your president you want to go and lay down your arms. And, and it was all propaganda. Propaganda, yes. And he came around two or three times. And he probably had more bullet holes in the wind. <laughs> anyway, he never got, I don't know whether he ever got shot down or what, but you could hear that airplane coming. <laughs> 20 miles away. You saw them? Oh yeah. We got, I never did save any of them. We all tore them up and threw them. In. But he dropped them out of the plane and they'd come flying down. He'd fly over the units so he'd get your attention. Well, you couldn't help but hear him. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, it was something, you know, to break up the day. But we had artillery across the, the road. And they woke you up when the tent flaps were straight out where you know they were firing. Because <laughs> we were all right on the end of the muzzle. Mm -hmm. And when we got all the, we could definitely hear them. But in the wintertime, um, usually the guys, as soon as they got in, would take the boots off. And we had felt pads in the boots and lay them by the stove to dry out from the moisture in your feet. So you have good warm boots the next day, but they they were fantastic. And we, I never did get really frozen or anything like. But the Ethiopians, it was terrible. They just, well, they'd never been in that weather, and they were frostbitten. But we had that. Oh, right across the street from us was a mesh outfit. Uh, tent hospital and then they had a portable shower we got a one shower and I think that was they sit, was set up by the river but, but in the summertime we go to the river and bathe wouldn't have worry about a warm but the, uh, during the winter we had a portable and it was two tents one was for our clothing and then one was a shower, there were probably 60 guys showered at the same time, and they pumped water out of the river and they heated it. And it was a portable, they floated all over um, the lot area, front areas. But other than that, food was pretty good, but when we got to Tokyo on R&R, &R, they took us right in, right at the airport, right alongside, and gave us a big Baked potato, uh, they sent a gallon of milk out, and we devoured that. <laughs> we never had fresh milk. And then a, a T-bone steak. And then we were released to go whatever we wanted to do for the five days. But re don't be late coming back, because that was definitely a no-no. 
Did you play card or playing music or mm. doing sports? Any other leisure things that um, you did? Baseball was very popular in Japan and Korea. If there was a place big enough to build a baseball field, there was a baseball. Did you no do that? No golf. Did you do that? No. No, uh, they were very sharp players. They, you mean the Korean people? Oh, they were unreal. And the Japanese also. During the war? Well... I'm talking about during the war. What well, did, yeah. Um, they had baseball fields all over. Well, there was not that many young... They were all grade school kids. Because the, you mean Korean? Yes. Uh, we, we never got near the Koreans because of the line. They couldn't come up where we were at. The, to get to the, where the people were at was way back. And we never got, we never got that far back, no. I uh, had very, very little uh, to do with the Korean people due to the fact that they were not allowed in the combat area. And uh, if they were, the MPs would pick them up and hustle them back because they didn't want them to get hurt or maimed or something some way. Mm -hmm. And we had enough problems without. <laughs> and uh, but in Korea, no, we. With the month I was there on training, the Korean people were very nice, mm. um, very honest. Oh. They wouldn't steal a penny. Uh, they were very honest people. The, uh, like, we'd go in and have some beers, and it was 360 yen to a dollar. Well, you break a $20 bill, you had to have a wheelbarrow <laughs> to carry the money. But you could leave your money on them and never be a penny short. They were very, very, very honest people. Good to know. They were unreal. Of course, I think it was quite a penalty there if you were mm -hmm. caught stealing. You probably ended up with very few fingers left. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then make sure you didn't steal again. Any other episode or story that you remember now during your service there? Only one story that really stuck with me all my life and was about a young boy we had in our company from Iowa, mm. a typical farm boy from Iowa. And he had a child, a little boy, when he was overseas. And his wife took pictures after picture. And every mail call, all I ever saw was this little kid's bare bottom on the sink getting a bath. <laughs> she always gave him a bath in the kitchen sink because he was just born. And I think I could see that kid today and see his bare bottom, but I didn't recognize it. That, that's all. That's all he ever. Every mail call. Here he was. Show you a picture. <laughs> here was a kid laying there, on it with his bottom sticking up on a towel, and that's my boy. And he was so happy to, you know, when it come close to his uh, time to go home. He said, "When are you going home?" And I said, "Well, I'm about a week and a half. I'm on the list." He said, oh, God, he said, geez, I'd love to go. I've never seen that kid. And, and finally, I get to thinking, hell, I'm not married. I had nothing to do. So I went to the com um, my commander and said, what if I traded spots with him so he'd get the heck out of here? Because I'm tired of seeing that naked kid. <laughs> <laughs> and so he said, well, we'd have to get the company commanders okay. So I went to he said, I'll go with you. So we went to the company commander. And the company commander grabbed me, and I thought he was going to kiss me. He said, I'm getting tired of seeing that kid's rear end. <laughs> and he said, would you mind seeing it? He said, he's on the next list to about two weeks or so. And I said, oh, I'd love to. I said, I've seen that kid's rear, bare bottom so many times. <laughs> and he said, me too. <laughs> so we let him, he, we traded they let me do it. Wow, very nice. <laughs> well, yeah, but this kid wanted to get home so bad that he, he almost was in tears. You know, he'd never seen that little boy but her picture. Must have been hard for the wife and... Oh, yeah. But they were just young. Oh. You know, they start your life off and 
they probably planned on having a child right away. Well, then he went in the service and he had no choice. <laughs> but boy, he he sure he sure wanted to see that. Yeah. Well, at least he got to see him a couple of weeks early. But when did you leave Korea? In let's see, I was on the middle of the Pacific. The Fourth of July, both years. So when did you leave Korea, remember? Uh, probably around the tail end of June. Uh -huh. 1952. Two. Uh -huh. mm. Then I went... Uh, you know, to be truthful, I don't remember how... I'm sure we went by boat. Well, I can't tell you. We left on a very large ship going... On the ship going over was about like a cork in a bathtub, very small, mm -hmm. 1,100, and we only ate twice a day going over mm -hmm. because the kitchen wasn't that big. And then they ran out of food the last night, and they gave us turnips. <laughs> Have you been back to Korea? No. No, I haven't. Do you know what happened to Korea after you left? I mean, how advanced now uh, Korean economy is now? Very good. They were always hard working. Well, like the any Oriental is is a very hard working. I never saw anybody in Japan even that didn't work. They were working fools, yeah. and uh, they didn't care what they did. Um, the one thing that noticed different though in Tok in Korea was they always thought their ghost was behind them, and so they always liked to have a jeep run just about as close, and they figured that killed the bad spirits following them. Really? Their religion or something? I I don't know. Never got into it, but we um, we never got back behind the lines that often, but. Uh, I do believe that they like to have a vehicle, everybody told me, hmm. be careful. But have you seen the modern Korea picture or did oh, yes. you, did, do you know about the current economy? Oh, it's a, Tell me about it. Well, this I, uh, compared to what it was, it's no, no, no comparison in the 50s. But Seoul was a pretty good sized town. Uh, all we had, I was driving the Jeep, and my unit commander was with me. And we had a trailer, and we loaded it full of booze. <laughs> they were going to start an officer's club. And uh, they went to a, we, a giant warehouse, PX, filled up with booze, <laughs> and drove back. <laughs> and what I thought, what well, kind? I don't know what all he, whiskey and gin and vodka, I don't know, everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, they started an officer club. And I, but uh, according to military, sergeants were allowed a bottle of whiskey a month or something or two, and enlisted men a beer a day or something. Mm -hmm. But we very seldom got it every day. Uh, one company got in trouble due to the fact they got some beer and got a little outrageous mm -hmm. with it and their company commander shut them off for the next shipment and we got it. <laughs> so our company commander said we'll take the day off and drink beer. <laughs> but he said if anybody gets rowdy it'll be the last day. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he made a point that you screw up you're going to pay the penalty. <laughs> And nobody did. So tell me about the, your knowledge about Korean economy right now. How advanced? Do you know anything about Korean economy no, now? No, I haven't followed it. But I think either either country, Japan or Korea, is in very good shape. Uh -huh. The only thing about Korea is they've got that problem up north, which is, I don't know there's any rhyme or reason to that man's thinking. Hmm. I don't know as if he has all his ducks in a row or what, but I, I don't think he's, 
I think the north and the south are just like night and day. Mm -hmm. Be, I, e, not only economy-wise, but the way people are treated. I don't think the North Korean is, I don't think he's a very good egg, but that's, What do you think about this? Korea is now 11th largest economy in the world. Is it? Yes. Yeah. That's, that's very good. Very... That's South Korea. Yeah. Yeah, not North. Not North. No. And that country is very democratic society. Pardon? Democratic. Oh, is it? Yeah. Yeah. You should go back. You yeah. want to go back? I wouldn't mind, but at my age it's a little tough. But Korean government has a program called Korea Revisit Program. It's a week in, in Korea. You can go to DMZ or Chuncheon where you yeah. station, and you will go to National Cemetery, you will see Seoul. And Seoul has now about 10 million population. Oh. It's bigger than New York City and yeah. has more high-rise than the New York City. I've and seen outlines of, and it's unbelievable how they built. Uh, I have a buddy that went on that trip. Ah. And, uh, what did they say? It was unbelievable. He w was in Korea, and he said it was unreal the way that the government has performed and uh, their economy grew. But, of course, during the war, the economy is always a mess. That's never, never good. There's never a good war. There's never a winner. Everybody loses. And do you know, you know that the Korean War being known as Forgotten War, right? Right. Why is that? I, I don't know. What do you think about uh, that? Well, uh, it was... True, nothing like World War II, which was just so a few years prior that maybe it was just like an offset, you know, like a, a, a third kid in the family, you know. Yeah. Uh, it, it just didn't hit, and it, I don't know what the heck we were, and it was very, very elusive. Uh, a lot of guys didn't know what the heck they were there for anyway, and but um, I think the whole thing started over the North Koreans getting so pushy with the communist factor, mm -hmm. and then uh, at the time Cuba was w with the United States. And then I think it was '57 is when Russia stepped in and they went communist. Fidel Castro. Yeah. And of course, he he lived to be a very ripe. Old, well, he's still alive. <laughs> uh, but I I think they're getting some tourism down there now. I I don't know how much, but but I know that all their cars were real classic '57 Chevys. Right. <laughs> yeah. The our American history textbook doesn't tell much about the Korean War. They have yeah. only about one paragraph or that's maximum a page. Yeah. So that's why we are doing this. Yeah. Don't you think that we have to teach more about the Korean War? Which well, came up with a very successful South Korea. Uh, oh yes. South Korea is just like night and day compared to that. Um, but I didn't realize they were the 7th, 11th. That's unreal. Yeah, very, very that, unreal to you. Um, that isn't that big a country, but they're very sharp. Uh, I never got to see anything really of Pusan. Pusan was a pretty good site. Was I think the capital, wasn't it? No, Seoul was capital. Seoul was capital. Busan was the first, the biggest uh, harbor. Oh yes, in okay. Korea, yes. Because when. From Sasebo to Pusan was just overnight yep. in an old tugboat. Yeah, it was very close. Um, I remember I got on the, the ship 
we slept on grass mats. I had a brand new M1 rifle, had the Cosmoline and everything on it. I woke up the next morning with a piece of junk. <laughs> and I thought, if that guy was up on the lines, he needed that rifle worse yeah, than I did. Yeah. <laughs> and I never said a word. Do you have uh, any other message you want to leave to this interview about your service in Korea? Uh, I didn't mind it at all. Uh, I think it was something that needed to be done. We did it. Um, how the outcome out, come out was not favorable for a lot of people. It was sort of Mickey Mouse, but um, I think there still is a problem in North Korea, very much so with leadership, which that's, I, I think they're treated like dirt. And how, so, with just a line between how the difference is, is unreal. And, uh, but that can't be helped. That's chickens one day and feathers the next. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, that's just the way the world turns. But I, I don't think he's much of a leader, to be truthful. Mm. But I think it's after me, you come first. <laughs> that's typical in a lot of cases. Mm. No, I, I, I didn't mind Korea at all, really. To be, uh, It was more just about like this country here, mm -hmm. South Dakota, the mountains and everything. Not mountains, but hills, I should say. Uh, and weather-wise, probably around the 38th parallel, the same as here. We'll get a 20s or 20 below or so once in a while. There it was two days in a row, and it was cold, but but we, at the tail end of Korea, our biggest job was policing up wire. We had wire laying on the ground all, all over China, all over Korea, so we pieced it up, and then we burnt the insulation off, because plastic in those days was not good. It wasn't flexible, and in cold weather, if you hit it, it'd crack and you'd have a leakage or something. So we had a lot of problems with lines. But then we pleased it up and then we, uh, some of the lines had copper in them and then burnt the plastic off and then retrieved the, the metal for just to keep it from being thrown away. And uh, but that's, then we only lost one man in the whole episode. The day before Christmas, it got real warm. And I had walked this trail, I don't know how many times, all of us had in the company. Well, this kid was a pretty good sized boy, a little heavier. And it warmed up and the ground got a little soft and he stepped on a landmine and lost a leg. But we never lost any lives at all. That was the only misfortune of. Mm. But and that was due to just luck of the draw. I mean, any one of us could have done the same thing, but it was always frozen, and it, we weren't as heavy as he. And, and that was what a Christmas present. <laughs> but he survived, and no. No, I, I don't know. Um, things were tailing down when I left quite a bit, but I don't think it ever ended for another year or so, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But no, I didn't mind it. I, I had a uh, sergeant from Detroit that was very nice, and uh, we got along great. We both loved jazz at the Philharmonic. Oh. <laughs> We'd sit and talk. Not cold nights like that, that's about all you... But we played some cards, and um, we always had an outpost that somebody was on duty outside the tents. And then the 32nd Regiment, we were attached to them. 
and the regiment was always, oh, four, maybe five miles behind the line, or on the average. And uh, we, uh, we got along great. Um, the, all the guys got along very good. I, we had a, one sergeant that was unfortunately bad, but I, I don't think he was in the company two days and he disappeared which didn't hurt nobody's feelings. Got it. Richard, I want to thank you for your oh, honorable yeah. service well, thank you. in Korea. And that gave us chance to rebuild our nation. And as I told you, it's the 11th largest economy in the world, 7th yeah. largest trading. So I want to thank you again, oh, Richard. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. Okay.